Today is October 31st, 2023. It's Halloween. And today we're gonna to be discussing creepy nursing skills. The skills that we usually don't cover in nursing programs and or that most nurses don't actually get to participate in until they're actually in the field performing care. We're gonna perform post-mortem care. In addition to post-mortem care, we're also gonna be placing our patient mannequin here inside of a, a cadaver or a body bag. And so if you have recently experienced a loss or if this is a sensitive subject, please turn away now. And I am Eunice Mathis. I'm a registered nurse and also the owner of Florida Training Academy. And if you like the video, subscribe to our channel, give us a thumbs up, and you can also show your appreciation by giving super thanks. That's just a minor donation so that I can continue to make videos like this and purchase additional supplies. What I have on everybody is actually excessive. But I have on these garments because some of my YouTube audience insists that in order for someone to perform postmortem care, they must be dressed head to toe. And so I do understand gloves. I understand some type of protective covering over your clothing. However, if your patient died of natural causes, a mask would be excessive. If there's no you know, spurting or if you don't expect any blood to be flashed in your eyes or bodily fluids, you also don't need the shield. So for video purposes, I'm going to remove these items. I would know when and how to utilize the um, facial mask and the shield if I had to in a real patient care setting. So let's discuss postmortem care. What would cause a patient's uh, to die? What will cause a patient's heart to stop? One of the number one causes of death in the United States is going to be cardiac disease. Cardiac arrest, the heart just starts quivering to the point that it stops. And once the heart stops, that's when we start performing CPR, okay? So our person here, we're going to say that Miss Lucy had CPR performed on her. And after a few minutes, after about 10 to 15 minutes, we can have a full team around her, but if there are no signs of life and or if she has other comorbidities, other diseases, other illnesses, such as diabetes, hypertension, maybe she had like an amputated leg, which means that she has severe circulation issues, the doctor is going to be gauging, you know, if we do bring her back, if we can get her heart restarted, you know, what is the potential of her having normalcy? what would be her chances of survival? And survival is not you being in a vegetative state. Survival is you returning to your level of quality of life that you had before you went into arrest. And so as I'm preparing uh, Miss Lucy here, you're gonna hear me talk every now and then and interject, but we just finished performing CPR on her. And unfortunately, she did not make it. So how do I as a nurse know um, I'm going to listen with my stethoscope. I'm going to listen to the apical pulse, which is here at the base of the breast. Um, I'm not going to listen on top of clothes. We never do. Um, but for camera purposes, I'm not going to be overexposing her. I will listen with my stethoscope for one full minute, listening for heart sounds. And that's particularly important if you're like in a home care setting, because hospice nurses go out, the hospice nurse cannot pronounce death. But what she does is she listens to the heart for one full minute. And if she doesn't hear any heart beats, she would notify the provider, the doctor. And that doctor would then pronounce death and give orders for post-mortem care. If this was in a home care setting, then more than likely there'd be a funeral home or someone else who's already been notified because this death would have been anticipated if it was a hospice patient. If it wasn't a hospice patient and we're in a home care setting, you call 911 just as you usually would, and then the police will come out, the firefighters will come out, they'll do their investigation. When I say firefighters, I mean your emergency medical services. They'll come out, they'll do their investigation, and then they will call the coroner's office to remove the body. If you're in a hospital setting, I hate to tell you, and a lot of our YouTube audience, they fuss me down about this. In the hospital setting, there is not a mortician. The CNAs or the patient care techs, along with the nurses, we have to perform post-mortem care on our patients. And so let me begin. All right, so I've provided privacy. I have clean glove hands. If a facial mask and a shield were required, I'd have those on also. I have my supplies here. 
I have my bath basin, which we're just gonna simulate a bath. I have some wipes. Our patient has tubes. In addition to having her um, advanced airway or her intubation tube, she also has a catheter. So in order for me to remove those tubes, I'm gonna to have to have large syringes. Syringes that don't have needles. These syringes are gonna aspirate only, and for the um, intubation tube, it's gonna pull out the air that's um, in the inflated tube, and the same thing for the urinary drainage catheter. I also have an adult um, incontinent brief or a diaper, and then also an incontinent pad. Here is our cadaver or our body bag. And I also have tags, these identification tags, you place a patient label on them. We put one on the patient's toe and also one on the exterior of the body bag. Once a patient is expired and the doctor has confirmed death, we need to clean this patient up and we also need to be considering the um, patient's um, religious beliefs, also the cultural or family beliefs and what they would want. Um, what I don't want is for a family member to come in while we're in the process of bathing the person. Um, CPR can be brutal. So the person could you know, have vomit, they could have urinated on themselves, they could have had their final bowel movement. So it's our job to get that taken care of right away. And so we use wipes, some water, And I know that I'm going to be removing this breathing tube. I'm going to connect my syringe because I don't want a family member to come in. And what I did was I pulled out the air and whenever I pulled out the air, there's a little bulb here. This bulb is now deflated. That tells me that the cuff inside of the um, endotracheal tube is also deflated. I don't want the family to come in to see all these lines and tubes, etc. So I'm going to start removing them. And I'm going to either have a towel or something near my patient, maybe under the head, um, because I know that whenever I start removing lines and tubes, that secretions can come out. And so this can be a little traumatic. And we almost got it out here. And what I'm doing is making sure that I keep my hand on the very end. When you're bringing out tubes, if you don't control it, it can flick. And when it flicks, that means you can get the person's bodily fluids on you. So it's really important that as you're removing a line, you're gradually removing it and you go ahead and you protect the end. I'm going to wrap this in my glove. I have a biohazard bag next to the bed. I'm going to discard these items. I'm going to use some sanitizer and I'm going to re-glove. And I'm going to continue the rest of the process, bathing the patient gently and removing any lines. In most of your hospitals, the patient care techs may be able to remove IV lines. And so don't be too concerned if you see us, you know, if, if that's not your, your job requirement or duty. Remember, every state is different. So I'm just gonna keep on wiping. I'm not gonna overexpose the patient. We still have our defibrillator pads on. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove these now. And notice I'm still treating this person in death as I would in life. I'm just not ripping these pads off because if I did, I could actually tear my patient's skin. So I'm going to gradually remove the pad and repeat the process on the other side. Once I'm done cleaning an area, wiping it, I'm going to recover. Working my way down now, I'm not going to overexpose the patient on the camera, but our patient has a urinary drainage catheter. We cannot have this in if she's going to the morgue. We're gonna go ahead and remove this, but in order to contain the body fluids that may be escaping, we're gonna put a diaper or a pad beneath the patient. So I'm gonna go ahead and prepare. I'm gonna wipe her in the proper direction. And every time I wipe a woman, 
I change spots on the moist wipe. Now I'm going to get my second syringe. And usually your chart or the hub here will tell you how many mLs of, um, of air has been inserted into this um, drainage bag, excuse me, into the urinary catheter. And so I'm going to make sure that I take my syringe, attach it, pull back, which means I'm aspirating on it, and remove the same amount of air that the hub says is inside of the catheter's balloon. And as I taught you before, as we're removing items, especially something that can wag or wiggle, as we're pulling it out, we want to be containing it and containing it and containing it. And this is a mannequin, so it's a little bit stiffer than it would be in a regular human. Contain. Remove. And put it in your biohazardous container. And again, I'm going to take off this glove and keep the tubing contained. Use sanitizer. Put on a new pair of gloves. Now I'm going to prepare my diaper. I'm going to move the patient towards me in increments. Remember, if this person is 100 or you know, 150, 180 pounds, you're not going to be able to pull this person and you should never pull them by their joints. So you grasp their shoulders, move the shoulders first, Grabs their hips, move that second, and then move the legs over. I like to make what I call a kick stand. I cross the leg nearest me. Push my patient and be very careful because this is a patient who's now deceased. So fluids can escape the ears, the mouth, the eyes, the rectum area, and also the urinary tract. So I need to be very careful with how I move her. If my gloves were obviously contaminated, I will go ahead and remove them now. But our patient fortunately did not have any bodily fluids escaping. And if I didn't have it, if I didn't say it before, the reason that we have this diaper on the patient is because again, bodily fluids can escape. Now I'm going to recenter her back in the center of the bed. All right, and so now she is clean from head to toe. I need to go ahead and remove these socks. You will be checking your facility's policies, but in most facilities, we have to put an identification tag on the toe. This would be one of the patient's personal belongings, as well as her glasses. So I'm going to make sure that these go in a um, personal belongings bag so that we can give them to our family members. You would try to close the eyes, and you would have done that before you actually provided the perineal care. You can try to close the eyes. However, the eyes do not remain closed. Um, the current practice is not to apply tape. Back in the day, they'd apply tape, but whenever, you know, this person may be in the uh, refrigerated area of the morgue for a few days. So whenever they go to remove the tape, it takes off the skin. So if the eyes don't remain closed, just do the best you can. Our person still has teeth. However, if the person had dentures and we take the dentures out during CPR, because if we need to intubate them, our patient was intubated. If we need to intubate them, we can actually break one of those false tooth off, off, off excuse me, <laughs> and it can go into their throat. But if, so for our case, we did not have to replace the dentures because our man mannequin here, our patient has their real teeth. 
But in the real world, if your patient has dentures, make sure you put the dentures back in his or her mouth um, whenever you're providing the care to the upper parts of the body because what we don't want is rigor mortis to set in and by then the jaw is fixed and we can't put those dentures back in their mouth. You apply a patient label, and our mannequin's toes are webbed, so I can't really put a toe tag on the toe. So for classroom purposes, I'm just gonna put one on the foot. Remember, I'm in a simulated environment, so things are not perfect, but we do the best we can. You would then pull the sheets back up Make sure the person looks, remove all of those items. Those shouldn't be hanging there. Um, make sure the person looks in death as they would in life. Make sure there are chairs in the room. Give the patient's family member now an opportunity to come in and grieve and, you know, just be with the patient. But after they leave, we now have to prepare this person and put them in a body bag or a cadaver bag. What is the purpose of this bag? because the body's gonna start decomposing. It doesn't happen immediately, but in most of your hospital settings, this is a bed that we need for a sick patient who's probably right now still in the ER. And so we're not going to allow a person once they're deceased, number one, germs, bacteria. Um, we talked about those bodily secretions, etc. We need to get this person refrigerated. We need them cool. And we also need to put them some in a bag that will catch those body fluids. And that's one of the benefits of these cadaver bags. Um, they are usually non-permeable. They're made of a really solid material. And this is how the body will be stored in the morgue until the funeral home comes. And that, you know, if something happens to a patient at 10 o'clock at night, the funeral home may not get there to the next day, the next morning, 6 a.m. We cannot leave a deceased patient out in a bed in a hospital or nursing home for that many hours. One of the first things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get our patient back onto her side. And so you remember what we did last time. We moved them in increments. There is something I do want to tell you. I had a patient who was deceased who was sitting upright in a, in a chair. Um, the heart monitor was still showing that the person had a heart rhythm. It showed the person was 100% paced. However, this was not 100% paced um, in reality because they died of a pulmonary embolism. And so they died from a respiratory issue. However, because the pacemaker, the battery operated device, was still going, it gave the appearance per the monitor that the person was still alive. And so if a person has an implant device such as a pacemaker, we have to call that device's maker um, so that they can come and deactivate that pacemaker. And they usually do that with a magnet, it's called a, a donut magnet, and they can, they can deactivate the pacemaker. Otherwise, the person's heart it's still going to be ticking, 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 but it's not their actual heart. It's just a device that's still going. All right, and so what I did was kind of like how you make a bed. I put half of the body bag under them. I have the open end nearest me. I'm going to lay her back. Again, being very careful because fluids can still escape the mouth. Now, I only have to bring the patient towards me a little. For video purposes, I'm not going to walk around to the other side of the bed. However, if this person was obese, or if I didn't feel comfortable reaching over, I would walk around to the other side. Okay, don't forget, we've placed the identification tag on the toe. I'll zip the bag. I place the other identification tag on the actual body bag. I 
want to recenter the person. This bag has straps. And what the straps are used for is whenever we're transferring the patient from the bed to the gurney or from the bed to the actual, um, you know, if they're downstairs, from the stretcher to the actual morgue, uh, especially if the person's really heavy, there are hoops or handles on both sides. This is going to allow those who are caring for the person to be able to handle the body um, and not drop it, okay? And so my name is Nurse Eunice, you all. This was one of the creepiest <laughs> um, nursing skills. There are others. If you are, or if you've ever worked in hospice, um, a place that I refuse to work is pediatric hospice. Um, I am not strong enough to deal with, you know, very sick kids or kids who are terminal. However, hospice is a wonderful place to work. Um, there is an order called the do not resuscitate order. That means that everything I said we performed on this person, we intubated them, we performed CPR, et cetera, we shocked their heart with the defibrillator. Whenever someone decides to die on their own terms, to be in comfort, um, to not have all these extra procedures, they'll usually consult hospice. And so they're given their pain medications, they have their families with them around the clock, and hospice, um, a person can even elect to, you know, die in the comfort of their own home with their family nearby. It's very peaceful and it's not as sad as what I've seen happen in a hospital. And so um, there is a cycle of life. Usually when you're in a hospital setting, after you get through taking care of a deceased patient in the hospitals that I've worked in, you'll also hear a lullaby playing a few moments later. What does that lullaby represent? It represents a new baby, a new life being born in the world. So I want you all to take the best care of your patients possible. Also take great care of yourself. This is Nurse Eunice. Thank you all for watching our creepy Halloween special on how to provide postmortem care, how to put someone in the body bag. Please subscribe to our channel and like our videos. And until next time, have a great day.